Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn webinar for January 17, 2018. Thank you for joining our presentation this month. Our presenter today is Dr. Maruna Petskrova. Sorry, I should have double checked your name before. Um, she's a senior lecturer in the Department of Health Services School of Public Health at the University of Washington and an investigator with the UW Health Promotion Research Center. Her work focuses on the dissemination and implementation of evidence-based programs for healthy aging and chronic disease prevention and management. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Allison. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today. In this webinar, I will talk about the role of academic community research partnerships in the dissemination and implementation of an evidence-based program, Enhanced Fitness. First, I will provide a brief overview of Enhanced Fitness, or EF, as, as it is sometimes referred to. Then, I will present two dissemination and implementation research projects that focus on EF. And I will conclude with a few words about future directions for dissemination and research. Before we get started, I wanted to include a couple of definitions to make sure that we are on the same page. So according to the National Institutes of Health, dissemination research is the scientific study of targeted distribution of information about evidence-based interventions to a specific public health or, or clinical practice audience. In essence, what, what are effective strategies for making sure that interventions reach their intended audience? Implementation research, on the other hand, is the scientific study of the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions into clinical and community settings. So in other words, once the intended audience has found out about the intervention pro an inter uh, program, what do they need in order to implement it successfully and with fidelity? And we conduct studies that test different approaches, both for dissemination and for implementation. Enhanced Fitness is an evidence-based older adult group exercise program. And I know that some of you in the audience might be familiar with the program, but I just wanted to give a brief overview to make sure that um, everybody has this information. So Enhanced Fitness was developed in the 1990s through a partnership that included the University of Washington Health Promotion Research Center, which is one of 26 prevention research centers funded by the CDC. Um, as well as Sound Generations, which was formerly known as uh, Senior Services, a Seattle area nonprofit, and Kaiser Permanente of Washington, which was formerly, formerly Group Health. Enhanced Fitness was tested in a randomized controlled trial that took place at a senior, senior center in the Seattle area. The trial showed that participation in Enhanced Fitness has physical and mental health benefits for older adults. Uh, in addition to that, enhanced fitness participation helps older adults improve or maintain function, as measured by three functional fitness tests, and it helps improve the quality of life for people with arthritis, which is why it is one of the programs recommended by the CDC Arthritis Program. On the cost side, uh, a 2013 study by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services showed that participation in enhanced fitness translates into lower healthcare costs, about $1,000 per year per participant. Mm -hmm. There is another study uh, that was conducted by CMS, and the results are going to come out this spring, and so we will have even uh, more current information about cost savings for EF. Enhanced Fitness includes exercises specifically designed for older adults. Um, it takes place in uh, one-hour classes that are delivered three times a week, and participants can sit or stand depending on their level of fitness. It is offered in uh, sessions of 16 weeks or on an ongoing basis, and it is taught by trained instructors, Sound Generations, which is the organization that disseminates enhanced fitness around the country is um, offering two-day trainings for instructors. 
the structure of the class, this hour of class, it has warm up and cool down exercises as well as aerobic strength, stretching and balance exercises. And as I mentioned, uh, during the, the uh, session, there are fitness checks, which are validated measures of upper and lower extremity strength and balance. Um, and they are arm curls, chair stands, and the eight foot up and go. Again, some of you in the audience may be familiar with these. And this is a way for us um, and so for researchers and for um, our partner sound generations to see um, how the participants improve through their participation in the program. So these fitness checks are conducted at baseline when um, participants first join the program and then every four months as much as possible. Enhanced fitness is offered by a variety of community organizations. Um, as I mentioned, Sound Generations is the uh, licensing organization for enhanced fitness and it licenses community organizations as diverse as uh, churches or other faith-based organizations, area agencies on aging, uh, parks and recreation departments, the YMCA, uh, nonprofits, and also continuous care retirement communities. And EF is being disseminated nationally. So um, since 1998, um, when the randomized controlled trial was conducted, EF has spread from just being in Washington state to um, over the lifetime of the program, 44 states and DC, and it has served almost 80,000 participants in these uh, 44 states plus DC. Uh, currently, Enhanced Fitness is as of uh, hot off the presses as of the end of December. Um, there are 1,147 classes throughout the country, um, and they are offered in 736 sites in 41 states plus DC, and Enhanced Fitness served 22,476 participants in 2017. So these are, are good numbers. Um, we like the fact that Enhanced Fitness is um, at the national level, and there are many places uh, where older adults can enroll in the program. But there is uh, a lot more work to do. If you think about, about these numbers and the millions of older adults who could benefit from the program, the percent in itself that of these older adults that attend Enhanced Fitness is pretty small. So one of the big charges for Sound Generations and for us as their research partners is to think about how to scale up the program, how to make the program available to even more participants. The recent, some recent dissemination milestones um, have been that in 2012, uh, Sound Generations has uh, signed a licensing agreement with YUSA, which is the National Resource Office for the uh, YMCAs, and also implemented an online data entry system. And so all of the uh, participant characteristics, demographic characteristics, uh, health status, as well as the functional tests that I mentioned are uh, collected through this online data system and report, reports can be created to show to participants, to send to their providers, or to, uh, to apply for grants. As I mentioned in 2013, uh, the CMS evaluation study showed how much uh, money participation in EF uh, saves in terms of healthcare costs. In 2015, um, Sound Generations signed a partnership with the American Council of Exercise, uh, which provides continuing education credits for the instructors. And then um, the most recent milestone is that in 2017, Enhanced Fitness was designated as a false prevention program by the Administration on Community Impact. So our work around Enhanced Fitness um, at the Health Promotion Research Center, so the, the research partners uh, for Enhanced Fitness, is informed by this dissemination framework. And I mentioned what, what the definition of dissemination research is in the beginning, but what I want you to think about is this, this difference between dissemination and diffusion. 
So on the right hand side uh, at the top of this framework, you see that arrow that says diffusion. And this is kind of the natural process through which user organizations, such as these community organizations that offer enhanced fitness, might find out, might find out about the program. Um, it's kind of up to them to do the work and for in the information to trickle down to them. On the other hand, dissemination is this very strategic and purposeful process through which the, um, the information about an evidence-based practice is sent out and it, it targets particular user organizations. And on the left-hand side of this framework, you see that there's a role for researchers like us at the Health Promotion Research Center and um, the disseminating organization, which in this case is Sound Generations, to partner and create this, this very targeted dissemination approach that makes sure that the organizations that can serve older adults through this program are actually able to learn about it and, um, and adopt it. So the next um, part of this presentation is going to be about these two uh, dissemination and implementation research studies. So as I mentioned, in 2012, um, Sound Generation signed this licensing uh, partnership with YMCA of the USA, which is the umbrella, the, the resource office for all Y associations around the country. However, um, even before this 2012 agreement, some local YMCAs were offering enhanced fitness on their own. And we call those YMCAs early adopters because they had seen the value of the program and they had adopted and implemented enhanced fitness before this big top-down um, effort to offer enhanced fitness throughout the YMCA network. So what we did was we uh, conducted this research where we examined facilitators and barriers to the adoption, implementation, and maintenance of enhanced fitness in early adopter YMCA associations. So these are, again, the ones that were offering enhanced fitness before the big licensing agreement took place. And we did this by conducting interviews with participants, with instructors, and YMCA staff that had been involved in implementing and delivering enhanced fitness. And these were... Um, YMCAs from around the country, not just in the Seattle area. Where so what did we find? Um, well, in terms of facilitators and barriers for the implementation of um, enhanced fitness in YMCAs, um, we uh, summarized our findings around these five main themes. So we found that instructor training is very important. Having that two-day um, training and a, a, a manual for uh, enhanced fitness make uh, certain that the program is delivered uh, with the same structure and, um, and with fidelity throughout these uh, different organizations. The structure of the program was important, the fact that it was um, designed for older adults and the fact that it had uh, these three sessions was important to maintain um, for, for participants to maintain the, the gains in the program. And also, um, but also at the same time, it presented some challenges for YMCAs that were trying to fit uh, three sessions in a week when uh, in their buildings they offer other types of programming. And so there's, there was some competition for, for space. Uh, we found that champions, uh, had a big role both in the adoption of the program, so the initial decision to offer to start offering enhanced fitness, and also for the uh, continued implementation of the program, perhaps in the face of changing priorities or diminishing resources. Um, another important thing that that helped with the sustainability of enhanced fitness in the in these Ys was this idea that. Enhanced fitness is a good fit for the mission of the Y. So for those of you who are, who are or may not be familiar with the Y, um, they are going through um, a big um, change in the sense that they are uh, becoming more and more a provider of health services in the community. So they are offering a lot of evidence-based programs around chronic disease prevention, such, such uh, 
the diabetes prevention program, physical activity like enhanced fitness, also live strong for cancer survivorship, um, and also uh, hypertension management. And so they are moving from this, uh, the, the previous image of them just being a swimming gym and, and serving just the people who want to stay fit to serving what they call health seekers. So people in the community who are trying to find resources to be able to stay healthy. And then of course, as is the case with many community organizations, funding was a barrier. Some of these uh, Ys had been able to offer enhanced fitness because they had received grants, but once the grant funding ended, it was difficult for them to continue to offer the program. From participants, um, we were able to gather some information, some qualitative information about the benefits of participation in EF. As I mentioned, we know that EF works to, to keep people healthy, but we wanted to hear about their experiences in the program. And one of the things that uh, was striking was how much they, um, how much the social aspect uh, was in was a motivator for people both to think about attending the program and for staying in the program. And then in terms of, of their quality of life, what we found um, very powerful were these testimonies from participants saying how much enhanced fitness has an impact of their uh, daily lives. So activities such as getting up from a chair, climbing stairs, um, completing household tasks, reaching you know, on a higher shelf, or, I don't know, a can of tomato sauce or something, they had very uh, concrete examples of how enhanced fitness is making a difference in their day-to-day -day lives. So in this study, we were able to learn about both what um, factors influence the implementation of enhanced fitness and how it benefits participants in a very concrete way. In the next study, and this is an ongoing study, we focus on enhanced fitness reach and sustainability. So the overall goal, goal is to create clinical community linkages between physical therapists and YMCAs in order to create a stable pathway for getting more participants into the program. So we want to create this, this structure where PTs refer older adults to the Y to take enhanced fitness after uh, completing a course of PT treatment. So, um, you know, just a, a quick overview of this project. Our goal is to, our more concrete goal is to develop and test an intervention for increasing physical therapist referrals for older adults to participate in enhanced fitness at WISE. And we structure our activities according to three aims. The first one is to do formative research with PTs and Y staff. And what that means is that we want to learn from PTs and from Ys what they need in order to be able to create this linkage. So we as a research center, as I mentioned, had done some, some work with Y staff, but not necessarily about this referral process. We had no experience working with physical therapists. And so we really needed to go in and, and learn from these two different worlds that we were trying to so what we did was we conducted observations in five uh, physical therapy clinics in the Seattle area. We interviewed 30 PTs from around the country, and we interviewed 20 Y staff from the, um, the Y associations that are involved in this study. The second uh, aim of the study is to develop and assess the feasibility of this intervention. So based on the learnings from aim one from, from this formative research with PTs and Y staff, we put together a toolkit uh, for increasing capacity in Ys to do outreach to PTs. And so the inter our intervention consists of this toolkit um, that includes a lot of resources for Ys, a Y change agent um, that is, is housed at YUSA at the national office, and also um, monthly uh, group technical assistance calls. And we are now testing this in a randomized controlled trial with two arms, where we have 10 Y associations in the intervention arm receiving this intervention and participating in these calls, and 10 Ys that are uh, just doing business as usual. So the way we think that this uh, 
would work is that we would create a virtuous cycle, right? So why associations build capacity for outreach, then they reach out to PTs, PTs recommend enhanced fitness to older adults, older adults participate in enhanced fitness at WISE, um, based on the results from, from the fitness checks, they see uh, there's evidence that they have improved function or maintained function and mobility, and there's pain relief. And then the Ys feed this information back to physical therapists who now learn of their patients' improvements, and, and that uh, makes it easier for them to see the benefits of the program and continue to refer. Just a very quick overview of what is included in this capacity building toolkit. Um, so this is uh, built on um, an Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, model, and it, it includes activities for seven months, uh, starting with how, how to build a team, uh, how to engage senior leadership, learning why uh, this project is important, through partnership planning and capacity planning, and then setting up the structures for data collection, planning for outreach, um, kind of building up each month a new set of skills that uh, culminates in the um, in month six when they went out and presented to PT practices, and then in the last month uh, reviewing and planning for quality. So in terms of future research and dissemination directions for enhanced fitness, in terms of research, um, there's, need, there's need for more evidence in terms of the effectiveness of enhanced fitness for specific conditions, such as knee or lower back pain management. Um, also, we are looking at um, implementation of enhanced fitness in public housing, so in, in subsidized housing for seniors and making it kind of a gateway for access to other chronic uh, disease and management programs. On the dissemination side, so this is really just about scaling up the program. Um, Sound Generations is continuously working, uh, trying to work with payers to get enhanced fitness reimbursed by insurance companies, and also developing an interface between um, OATS, between the, their data collection system and electronic health records to facilitate the type of clinical community linkages that, um, that uh, I mentioned. So to summarize, um, the national reach and recognition of enhanced fitness is growing. Um, through this partnership with the YMCA, enhanced fitness has the opportunity to reach um, a lot of older adults throughout the country. And through this, this partnership between um, researchers and community-based organizations, um, what we can achieve is more strategic dissemination approaches. So instead of, of having that uh, natural diffusion, um, having targeted strategies for, for dissemination, and also, also evaluations of implementation with a view to sustainability. What does it take um, to ensure that the program can continue and that older adults can Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present. Um, this is my contact information, and I've also included the contact information for Paige Dennison, who is the EF okay. National Director of Sound Generations. And, um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. That was um, a great presentation. Um, just want to remind everyone, you can type your questions into the chat box in the bottom right. Um, I, I loved hearing about all the different research programs that you have going on, Dr. Pestrupova, Dr. Marina. Um, we were just talking in our team the other day about the difference between implementation and dissemination. So I think it was really great that you pointed that out to begin with as well. I think sometimes it can get kind of blurry what the difference is. Yeah. And, uh, we'll wait just a minute to get some questions. Hold up. Yeah, I mean, we have found that, especially with enhanced fitness, it's uh, the program is mature enough that um, you know the the evidence base is is pretty stable uh, and strong. And so now uh, our focus as, as the research partners is um, 
on how to make sure that as many older adults as possible benefit from the program. So this is our, our bread and butter these days, dissemination and implementation. And have you um, used any strategies that other evidence, like similar strategies as other evidence-based programs, like you mentioned diabetes self-management or CDSMP, do you think there is some similarity between them all as far as implementation goes? Um, I mean, I think that um, I think with with CDSMP, one of the challenges is with the or or one of the models that it, that would be interesting to to replicate is this this peer model. Um, I think that in most cases the EF instructors are not, um, I mean they have to have some some fitness training and so it's difficult to find the type of lay leader that CDSMP uses. But there have been, I mean one of the participants that we interviewed in the first study was actually somebody um, who, uh, who started as a participant but then became an instructor. So mm -hmm. So there's always the question of, of what are the, again, identifying what are some of these barriers to um, to implementation and making sure that they are, they can be addressed, especially in, in low resource settings. But um, both um, Kate Lorig, who is the developer of the Chronic Disease of Management Education Suite and Paige Dennison from Sound Generations are part of the Evidence-Based Leadership Council. And this is this is a, an entity that tries to bring the, together developers of, of evidence-based programs um, and to have them learn from one another. So I'm sure there's, there's going to be some cross-pollination. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. That's a, a nice that they're developing that center as well. That's going to be very helpful. I think the other um, the other sort of next task for us with Enhanced Fitness um, is to really tap into the social aspect of the program and uh, measure the effect that it has on social isolation. Because again, we have these these um, qualitative data, um, these testimonials from participants, but um, we do not currently collect uh, validated measures of social isolation. And so for us, that, that's also a next step, thinking about how to, uh, how to include those measures in the data that's being collected on a regular basis through EF without increasing the, the burden on participants. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. I know sometimes we feel like we're overburdening participants with all the surveys and evaluations, but um, it's a lot of important data to information to be collected. And uh, we have a few questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and read those. Um, from Peter Coyle, thank you for the excellent presentation. Have you already started the process of attempting to secure, secure reimbursement for um, enhanced fitness? If so, can you elaborate on the strategies you're using and how it's going? So um, I think that this is this is more in the in Sound Generations Court because they are the the licensing organization. I know that they have, um, that Enhanced Fitness is covered by um, the, what was Group Health Medicare Advantage Plan, uh, now Kaiser Permanente of Washington. And I think that has been uh, partly due to the fact that Enhanced Fitness was developed in uh, partnership with, uh, with them initially. Other than that, um, there are some some efforts around the country, but um, nothing concrete so far. 
and it's it's a it's proving a, a pretty tough nut to crack um, and we're hoping that with the new data from the CMS study that is is uh, going to be published uh, this spring that that will will help us make a stronger case for reimbursement um, we also hope that you know with with CMS recognizing reimbursing for the diabetes prevention program it kind of opened the door for other uh, evidence-based programs to achieve that status if you have any ideas I'm, <laughs> I'm open to I'm eager to hear them we've also discussed here at the Alliance um, walk with these in that same kind of process of reimbursement and just the economic um, impact of it. So we definitely also would love to put our heads together. <laughs> we could make some progress on that. Um, and the next question, what recommendations do you have as first steps to disseminate an evidence-based exercise program that has published RCT evidence? So I think the, you know, if you go back to, can I go back to the yeah, you I, should be able to go back in. Slides, right? so, mm -hmm. okay, so. <clears throat> so if you go back to the HBRC dissemination framework, I think a very important step is um, the box on the left-hand side under dissemination resources. So my sense is that um, the person who has who has posed the question is um, in the in the researcher box and. What we have found with uh, enhanced fitness is that partnering with a dissemination, disseminating organization, uh, in this case, Sound Generations, has really um, helped disseminate the program. Because, you know, we in in our research center don't have the expertise for marketing, for creating business plans, for um, collecting license fees, and and things like that, and so. Partnering, you know, finding a disseminating organization, um, I think is a is a is a great next step. Um, and I will tell you that our experience with another program that was developed at, at HPRC, uh, which is called Pearls, which is a, a dissemination, uh, sorry, a depression management program for older adults, has been different because we have not had this the, the support of a disseminating organization, and so the program is. Is not as wide as widely uh, disseminated. Okay, so I think that so first finding a disseminating organization and then thinking about who might be the user organization um, and um, and trying to to create this this pipeline for dissemination um, and finding the right partners. So that that would be. Great. That is fantastic advice. Um, and I know now we've gone five minutes past 1230. So I um, want to thank everyone for joining us today. And for those of you that need to sign off, um, you can go ahead and do that. Um, if you could take a minute to evaluate today's webinar in the chat box, that would be great. And um, just a brief reminder that our next webinar will be um, February, February 21st with Dr. Heather K. Vincent who will discuss physical activity for children with joint pain and obesity.